It seems all of us love a good hero story. I mean, all of us as children, at least most of us, have grown up watching shows, unless you're really older in the crowd, maybe you didn't watch these shows, but you read about them, all of these different heroes. I mean, they were the great people that could do more than anyone else. And this has been one of those universal truths for all of recorded history. People love real and fictional heroes. In the ancient world, we had the Greek mythology, and they had all their heroes as part of that. Then as you move forward through history, there were tales about Robin Hood, which is one of my favorite animated films, as they captured that with Disney. But you heard about Robin Hood and the Knights of the Round Table, all these big tales. Our early American culture had some real-life heroes like George Washington. I think of Fred Frederick Douglass also, Harriet Tubman, Abraham Lincoln. And then that's not even to think about the American sports world. I think of like Jackie Robinson. I know that sports list of heroes could just go on and on. And now here in our current culture, in our current time, we are certainly infatuated with superheroes. We could just ask Marvel and DC people, which they would have a clash of which one's better, but we could just ask them about all the huge dollars they're making right now. And I'm just specifically talking Marvel ones, but like Spider-Man, Iron Man, Captain America, the Hulk, Thor, we've got the Black Widow, we've got Captain Marvel, we've got the Black Panther, and that list could keep going. It's an exhaustive list. But what is it? Why do we love stories about heroes so much? See, I believe it goes well beyond, or goes much deeper than just mere entertainment. In an article from a few years back in Relevant Magazine, they give this explanation, and you'll see it here on the screen, you can follow along. It says this, this is a quote out of the article. It says, superheroes deal with the interior elements of humanity. They are colorful incarnations of the human soul. And in this way, we put our hopes, our fears, dreams, emotions, and all the unspeakable facets of human nature into physical form and loose them in fantastical worlds to see what we may learn from them. Hmm, that's a good quote. See, it is our superheroes, and yes, our everyday heroes, that help us learn about our deepest longings. Specifically, I think of our desire to contribute to the places around us with a meaningful impact. It's to see how we are actually helping to make the world a better place. See, it is the heroes in our lives that move us to explore life's lessons and our faith, which both ultimately guide our lives. Our main text from today reminds me of a bit of a heroic tale. And it is the only miracle, I've already kind of alluded to this, it's the only miracle of Jesus that appears in all four Gospels. It's the only miracle of Jesus that's in all four. And this should give us a pretty clear clue as to how significant this heroic tale was to the early church. And just to recap a tiny bit, the setting is that Jesus has just crossed over the Sea of Galilee to the other side by boat. And now here he is found on the side of the hill with his disciples. But sure enough, far off into the distance, okay, here comes the crowds that have been following him. And here they come on foot. And so there's going to be another teaching opportunity for Jesus. And we are told that there were about 5,000 gathered that day but you might have caught it because with further study, this number only specifies males in attendance. And many of you know that. I see a lot of heads nodding. We know this, right? The Gospel of Matthew's account emphasizes the size of the crowd by adding that besides women and children. So this has led most biblical scholars to actually believe that the number that was fed that day was more in line with about fifteen to 20,000 people. Okay? Last week we discussed... The healing of the paralytic. We talked about a crowded house. Now we're talking about exponentially more people on a crowded hillside. Okay? Big stuff. And it is here, on this really full populated side of a hill, that the stage is set for a young, ordinary person to become a forever hero. So this, this morning, I want us to look at the characteristics of this ordinary boy. 
You might even have missed it just listening in. There was a young lad. We're going to talk about it. This ordinary boy that became a hero to an entire community in need. And our first characteristic here is that heroes are born out of circumstances and they rise to the occasion. They are created in a time of strife and struggle. It's the first point there, Pat, uh, here. Ordinary heroes are born out of circumstances. See, we don't know much about this young hero in the feeding of the 5,000. Just that he was a boy and he had some food with him. And we also find out that the disciple Andrew found this boy. He goes to him. Maybe he had a connection to him. Maybe he knew him. Who knows? But we discover that you know, Andrew goes to him and we find out about five barley loaves of bread. And we find about, out about two fish. Now just a few extra details here that I think are incredibly important for us to understand. Meals in biblical times typically required quite a few loaves of bread. And this is due to the fact that bread actually served as the utensils of the day. There weren't a lot of like forks and spoons, so you used bread. Some cultures still do this. You're eating with your hands, you're using a lot of bread to get all the tasty stuff. It's a vehicle for what you're going to consume. That's, that's a good life. Anybody love tortillas? I love tortillas. It's a little bit of the same idea going on here. Love that. But it also turns out that this barley bread was the cheapest bread available in Jesus' day. It also happens that it was the least satisfying bread. So it's kind of a last resort of most folks. If you had enough means available, you would certainly going to choose that cheap white bread that we love, right? Oh, that good homemade cheap white bread? Joe says no. Okay, never mind. But you would choose some better bread. Okay, You weren't going to choose to eat the barley loaves first. But why is that important? Okay, Well, more than likely, this, this points us to the fact that this boy comes from an underprivileged family. But we should make no mistake, because that's not an outlier in Jesus' day. It is estimated that 80 to 90% of people living in first century Israel were poor. And most of these poor people were involved in either farming or some kind of shepherding. Now since at that time the Roman Empire was in this fun habit for them, not for everybody else, of controlling as much land as they possibly could in first century Israel, many families were forced by necessity to become sharecroppers. Okay, working the land and intending vineyards and crops that were owned by many people or owned by someone else. And as a result of that, many people were just one drought, one famine, one payday away from disaster. And we find that it is out of that underprivileged and terrible conditions that this young man rises to the occasion with this huge needy crowd on a hillside and he hands over his lunch for the benefit of others. See, oftentimes when faced with challenging situations, we find ourselves having no idea what to do. Kind of like the disciples in this moment, and we'll talk about that just in a little bit. But this is the reality. The starting point should always be to bring what we have to the attention of others and ultimately bring it to the attention of Jesus. There's going to be a picture up here on the screen. This is Malala Yousafzai, which I have to say that last name really fast because that's the only time I'm going to say it. Whew. But this is Malala. She was born July 12, 1997 in Pakistan to a family that valued education. Her father actually is an educator and he even came to run a chain of schools in their home region. Malala and her father bravely encouraged the education of both boys and girls, even though the fundamentalist religious Taliban, Taliban who oppose education and freedom for girls and women, even as they were gaining more and more power in her area, they still were outspoken about this. On October 9th of 2012, while on a bus in the Swat district after taking an exam, Malala and two other girls were shot by a Taliban gunman in an assassination attempt in retaliation for her activism. Malala was hit in the head with a bullet and she remained unconscious and in critical condition at a hospital in Pakistan. But later her condition did improve enough that she could be transferred 
to a hospital in the UK. The attempt on her life sparked a worldwide outpouring of support for her. And some international reports in January of 2013 said that she may have become the most famous teenager in the world. After her recovery, Malala became a prominent activist for the right to education. Based out of Birmingham, England, she co-founded the Malala Fund, a nonprofit organization. And then she co-authored later that year in 2013, I Am Malala, an international bestseller. She also in 2014 was the co-recipient of the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. And at that time, she was the youngest ever at the age of 17 to receive that Peace Prize. Also, she, that, so since then, sorry, that Nobel Peace Prize, she's been on tours and going and talking to so many world leaders and sharing her story toward her goal of education for all. She eventually went on to graduate from high school and then earned a spot in Oxford University where she undertook three years of study for a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy and politics and economics. She graduated just last year in the year 2020. It's her courage that we can see and it's clear in her actions and her tireless work towards education for all and her refusal to remain quiet on issues of injustice even knowing it could cost her her life. See, knowing that the Taliban has threatened to shoot her again, specifically a Taliban spokesman has said this, if we get another chance, we will definitely kill her and that will make us proud. She's well aware of this. And Malala speaks to this. This idea that if she were ever confronted again by a Taliban gunman, she said, I'll tell him how important education is. and That I even want education for your children as well. And I would tell him, that's what I want to tell you. Now do what you want. See, heroes are born out of circumstances. And they rise to the occasion. Now back to our main text here. This boy doesn't have much. Okay? He's just got those five loaves. He's got those two small fish. Probably just enough food to feed himself for the day. And yet he jumps at the opportunity to share and to give the only thing he has because ordinary heroes give to those around them as an act of trust in God. See, the culture in which this boy lived also had some very key values, some distinct characteristics that would have been ingrained in his heart and ingrained in his mind. And these core characteristics directed his act of faith. And the first one is, and this is going to probably be somewhat of a, a good recap, familiar stuff, but it's that the community is always more important than the individual. See, this young man was t always taught to put the needs of others ahead of his own. He is willing to sacrifice his personal privileges, right here it's just five little loaves and two fish, okay, for the greater benefit of the family, the tribe, and then certainly his entire community. See, what matters is not what's best for one, rather what matters for the village as a whole. Instead of the I language, there would be an emphasis on the we language because it's a communal society. See, ordinary heroes in a culture like this focus on the greater good and they place the community impact ahead of their individual desires. Okay, so that's characteristic number one. A second core value of the community he would have grown up in is hospitality. See, if a stranger shows up in the town, it was the duty of that town to show them a complete welcome, to show them a complete generosity, and to not give lavish hospitality, risk the family and or the village, this whole town being disgraced. So in order to maintain the honor of your community, you not only welcomed the guest into your home, you literally were rolling out the red carpet treatment for these folks, too. And this means you housed them. This also means that you fed the guests well. And part of that feeding them well meant you prepared more food than they could possibly ever eat. And you know that includes a lot of extra fresh loaves of bread. It's because of this that no one you know, wants to ever bring shame and dishonor on your family, on your community. Or, and so people would do what is good, 
or maybe what we would say is best for these strangers, for these unexpected guests. And all of this taken into account, let's consider how this boy is moved to share all of his lunch. I mean, the boy is asked to share what is likely his full amount of what he'll eat that day. And he gives it freely and willingly over to Andrew that others might be able to benefit too from what he has. I think this is a huge moment of trust in God's abundance. Because here the disciple, John, who's our author of this particular text, he wants us to to compare and contrast, to see this boy's trust and compare that with the actions of the disciples who find themselves in this remote place with Jesus and thousands of people. And what do the disciples start to do? They start to panic a little bit. Where can we buy this much bread? This would take at least eight months of a salary. Oh man. In this moment of great need, they have an instance of what I would call collapsed trust. They have a moment of scarcity thinking that there isn't enough to go around. But these are the same disciples that up to this point, they have been first-hand witnesses to the Word made flesh. They've seen Him working miracles. They've seen Jesus teaching the crowd and taking care of those that would come and follow along with them. And yet, this collapsed trust, they'd rather kind of pack it all in Push the crowd away. Then dig deeper to trust God's provisions once more. See, ordinary heroes purpose to love others. This young man chose to surrender his lunch because of his love of other people. And Jesus chose to use the boy's gift to share tangible love with others. And from here, Jesus gets the loaves and the fish and He blesses them. And not only did people eat, you all know this account because you've read it in four different Gospels, they ate as much as they wanted and there were still leftovers. And isn't that the picture of what I talked about, the core value of hospitality? Jesus gets it, right? He knows He was born and raised in that culture. It's not just enough for the need, it's more than we could ever even eat. And remember what the disciples said, maybe you followed along, maybe you just heard it, about these five loaves, these two fish. They said, but how far will this go among so many? See, when we purpose to offer our resources and our energies and our lives sacrificially, relinquishing our hold on whatever God has given us, God will then take these ordinary things and He will do the extraordinary. But we should be reminded that giving ourselves intentionally, what I'm calling purposing, giving yourself intentionally to love requires a big imagination. Okay? Big picture thinking. And it requires a grand hope that comes from deep within. We cannot get caught up thinking that our worth or our resources are too little to serve others. I mean, this young boy... Right here, this young hero could have easily held on to his own lunch, thinking that it was too measly to help, right? That would have been easy to do, correct? We can all, I mean, even if it was just, hey, if we had five little loaves and two fish in this room right now, we'd be like, well, we're going to be a little hungry. Just the reality. He could have done it. He could have been reluctant to let others also see, think about those barley loaves, what that barley bread represented. He could have been reluctant to let others see that he had a poor person's resources. We also cannot afford to get trapped in the calculating of the limits of our love because we don't want our resources to be used by people that may not deserve it see the boy could have easily withheld his lunch thinking this and and this is what i think like why didn't these other people plan ahead come on why would they dare to come on this journey and not bring any supplies with them that seems fair 
You see, instead of clinging tightly to his limited resources or, or limiting his love to those that might have deserved it, this hero intentionally chooses love and it appears that Jesus in our text delights in seeing a humble, a generous boy using his gifts to bring goodness to others. See, this boy demonstrates the kind of purposeful love that Jesus then takes and he turns into an extraordinary moment for all. But for this to happen, we must give ourselves intentionally to love, surrendering what we have, surrendering who we are to the God who is love. Now, maybe you and I are alike, which is always a scary thought, right? But I always wonder when I come across this, and so I'm assuming others wonder about this too. You know, why didn't Jesus just speak the food into existence? I mean, couldn't He have just manifested some food for everybody? Kind of like the stories we hear with the uh, Israelites, the manna coming down from heaven. Couldn't Jesus have done that? Did Jesus really need the little boy's loaves and fish to feed the huge crowd? I'm letting you think with that for just a second. Sometimes I rush by those questions, but that's a good question. See, I believe the boy was tremendously important that day. I would even go so far as to say that Jesus really did need him. And I would say that Jesus really needs you and me too. And before you tune me out, because anytime we hear... God doesn't need us. I want you to know the reality is God is not needy. Understand that. God is not needy. God gives from abundance. He isn't needy. But hear this. What is modeled to us through Jesus, keep in mind, the divine made flesh, is this, is that God has chosen to base His work of love in our world on the intentional act of self-surrendered love. Self-surrendered love. It's a, good, it's a good turn of phrase. What is that? What is that? Well, you see, this is what I think. I believe that we often miss out on the opportunities to be an ordinary hero because we don't typically want to accept the kind of suffering that comes with being a common person that God uses for extraordinary moments. And it's this. It's because of things like this. Being an ordinary hero typically results in long stretches of doubts, long stretches of anonymity, like this little boy that we don't ever get a name. He's not a star. And it also comes with long stretches of what seem like and what appear to be a lot of ineffective work and a lot of ineffective effort. See, being an ordinary hero often means giving up. It's ceasing with the demanding our own way. And we do that because that's the model that Jesus lived. Because the way of the cross looks like giving up your personal autonomy for the sake of others' well-being. That's self-surrendered love. And this means that we have to make the decisions to do the regular every single day choosing to be ready to step in to our ordinary hero moments. So the question I want you to ask here as we begin to get to our actionable step and we begin to think about wrapping up for today. Are you willing to stop your scarcity thinking? Meaning that there's not enough to go around. You've got to get yours first and hold on to it. Are you willing to stop your scarcity thinking and begin to see your bigger responsibility to the greater good of everyone? That's a big question that I just laid on you. So here's your actionable step. If that's something you're interested in at all, here's our actionable step for today, is to determine to say yes. See, we must be the ordinary heroes that determine to say yes even before 
the extraordinary moments present themselves. Let's understand this. And we talked about it a little bit last week too, so I just want to remind you that, that Jesus can see us fully. He saw the faith of those friends last week in the hearing of the, the healing of the paralytic. He can see us fully. He knows us. He knows that we struggle with things like pride and fear and bitterness, things like that. Yet He is looking for us, for the people who will decide that they are going to fully participate in His way and do what He calls them to do even before He shows us all the details. It's this kind of person who says things like, if I'm called to go, I'll go. If I need to move, I will move. If I need to leave my job, as scary as that sounds, I will leave it. If I have to give up demanding my own individual rights, I'll give them up. If God tells me to love people with my last dollars, with my last bits of food, then I will give them away. See, before the stirring inside your souls ever tells you what to do, where to go, and what you will need to surrender, your determined answer must be yes. Whatever it is that each one of us is supposed to do in partnership with God, we resolve to say yes, that we will do it. So allow me here in our closing moment in a small way, to recognize so many of you here in this room, so many of you that are joining us online today. I want to recognize you that are working hard to rise to the occasion in a time of challenge and struggle. Those who are the real-life, ordinary heroes among us. We see those of you who are raising your children without the support of a responsible partner. We see those of you who might be helping to raise grandchildren or other family members' children because they can't. We see you. We see those of you striving so hard to overcome the cycle of abuse or maybe it's addiction that has been present in your family for too long. We see that. We see those of you who are out there working multiple jobs to provide for your household so that your home has more opportunities than you had when you were coming of age. We see those of you who are working hard to change those unhealthy habits that have just plagued your life for too long. Keep going. We see you. We know and we see those of you who have been really treated unfairly, especially in these last 18 months, in the workplace. We see you. And I'm so grateful that you continue to lean into that. And you still try to spread goodness in your work environment in spite of all that negativity. We see you and we grieve with those of you that are battling disease. That is trying to destroy your body. We see that. And those that are walking along someone that are the loved one of someone battling a terrible disease that's trying to destroy their body. We see you. And we celebrate as best we can with those of you who have been knocked down by life time and time again and yet you are back on your feet and you're moving forward towards something better. We see you. Your determination to say yes is seen and it is important because you are an inspiration to all of us here. Thank you for being an everyday hero to so many people and helping us to learn about the ordinary heroic moments of following your deepest longing. Whether you even knew it when you said yes to it. Following your longing. You are contributing to the places around us with a meaningful impact. And we see you helping to make the world a better place. And I get it. I think we all understand, right? It is difficult to raise your head up when life is just beating you 
down. Yet, you're doing it. We need more people like you in our world. We do. And I want you to know I'm glad that we get to share our lives together. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for leaning in when it gets so incredibly difficult. And thank you for being a reminder that it's ordinary people doing the ordinary things that lead to the extraordinary moments. Let's pray.